So we have come to our last session. Um, and uh, this is basically a panel discussion. So we got uh, um, our guests from uh, different councils. So I'm going to invite them here. So the whole idea is to, um, so we have like three questions basically. So I just wanted to put it to them so that they can uh, you know, give their thoughts on that. And then in the end, I think we'll have around 15 minutes to have some open discussion and asking questions from them. So uh, without any further ado, so I would like to invite our first panelist, Steve Manning. Uh, Steve is an environmental health practitioner uh, from the Newport City Council. So Steve, please okay. take a seat. I think we got uh, the names here. And our second panelist is Joanna Matthews. Uh, and uh, uh, Joanna is Principal Civil Engineer and NEC Project Manager from Southend on C City Council. And our third panelist is Colin Horton uh, from Green Spaces Officer from Rugby Borough Council. And our last but not the least, we have Deborah Fox, Placemaking Group Manager from Surrey County Council. So welcome everyone. So the, the whole idea of this session has been um, to have some open dialogue mm -hmm. in terms of uh, you see that how the network is evolving and the focus in terms of how we can make the cities sustainable and bring the green and blue infrastructure you know, into them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we, while we wanted to have this open discussion, but I wanted to pick up your brain <laughs> on our first question, and maybe you can go one by one. It is that what are the challenges of implementing green and blue space infrastructure in your city or town? Maybe we can start with Steve. That's a good question. Um, are you hearing me okay on the mic? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I, think, I think the hardest thing is reaching the widest possible range of stakeholders so that you can uh, achieve a sort of holistic approach to uh, looking at these subjects because they're so unavoidably complicated and the number of different players that can actually make things happen are unavoidably multiple in their, their nature and you need to be able to get to everyone otherwise it can fall at the first hurdle for the uh, simplest of regions. For example, you might not have considered the heritage aspects of a, a wall that you were planning on putting some green infrastructure in front of, and it becomes a, a, a no-go situation. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Joanna? Um, I don't know if anybody knows South End on Sea, but it's very small. We're obviously locked by the Thames Estuary. We're locked in by, South, by Essex County Council, Rochford Castle Point, so we don't have a lot of space. And the biggest challenge for us really is, is any kind of development, whether it's a, a new houses or whether it's a pop-up park, most things have to go up. Mm. We have, um, as a local authority, we have a, a great many things that we do have to deliver. Um, so, uh, for example, key priorities might be um, active travel, so new cycle lanes is the government are pushing. So you've got all these competing aspects. Mm. And, um, and the key thing as well is analysing what it is you're trying to deliver and what that person has been subjected to in terms of risk. So some people, you might say, can we use blue-green infrastructure? And they'll think, that's lovely, great. If your house is about to fall into the sea or if your house has been flooded over 10 times, you really don't care what the local authority is doing as long as you remove that element of risk to the way in which they live. So it's very important to understand the community you are dealing with before you start to go in and make any changes or proposals. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. So basically you're saying that one solution doesn't fit all. No, horses are <laughs> horses. <laughs> yeah. Colin? Uh, I think there are a few things really, um, and some of them interlink quite a bit. Uh, funding, definitely a challenge. Obviously we're 13 years into austerity now. We've had some of the money back that we had to take off us from 2010 onwards, but you know we're still massively down by 60 odd percent. I think is the average uh, nationally. Um, workload is a challenge. Um, 2020 was a bit of a blessing in that lots of people got to know their local open spaces. 
that increased demand where everything else uh, and challenges around workload, which was already a struggle anyway, I think. Um, that also sort of links in with recruitment. Um, we've known that we've had an work aging workforce in the sector for a number of years. It seems to be quite a challenge to get young people uh, to move into the sector. Um, and that's got worse as well with a lot of people retiring um, over the past few years as well. Um, and I think that's also linked to awareness and understanding and respect for the sector as well. Whereas you will get some people that will push for things like, they'll say, oh, we want some more wildflowers near our area. And then what you actually find out is they're after a pictorial mix of South African and Californian um, flowers and things like that is actually what they were thinking. Um, and you're always never far away from a politician suggesting, oh, just get some prisoners to go out and plant some bulbs, implying that what we do as a career requires no specialist knowledge and should be viewed by as a punishment that they would dish out to someone. So, um, so there are a few challenges there, and that also leads in, I think, to councillors flip-flopping where they'll ask you to do some tree planting or meadows, and then they'll turn around. That looks untidy, cut the grass, please. Um, so it's getting that consistency politically as well. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can move to Deborah. Yeah, well, the great thing about coming last is that everyone else has said what you wanted to say. And I, I had ten things written down here, and at least eight of them have been covered off, especially in the last uh, contribution. So I'm, I'm going to go and major on uh, design quality. So um, greening, per se, doesn't really mean anything in, in design terms. Uh, but holding on to a beautiful and sustainable design all the way through the design process to delivery and then aftercare is, I believe, the, the really critical factor here. Uh, really well-designed places, and we'll come on to you know, some of those good exemplars later on. Um, they've resulted uh, you know, uh, in the culmination of a master plan. Um, there have been green spaces uh, delivered over a period of time, whether that's in a development or in a city or a town in the case of Surrey. And um, actually, the, the technique of holding on to uh, good design and you know, making sure that those green elements still continue all the way through the delivery process and even through value engineering to see it delivered on the ground, that, that to me is the biggest challenge. And you know, within that, there are subsets like in local government, um, we do have a bit of a churn of project managers. So you might lose the project manager who, who perhaps initially came up with that design vision with stakeholders. Uh, you, might, uh, you might get a change in politicians or different, um, different um, you know, uh, uh, types of ambition. You might even ch see a change in government policy. So in transport terms, we've seen the, the inverted pyramid now where you've got pedestrians and cyclists at the top. But many of us, when we started our careers, it was almost the other way around. <laughs> so, you know, things change, but I, I can't think of a better time to deliver green and blue infrastructure in our cities, in our towns, in our villages than now, because all of the policy imperatives line up. And even though perhaps our business case processes don't fully 100% support its delivery, I think, I think it is the, the zeitgeist now. We've, we've got to grab it and really go with it. Yeah, I think you made a very good point about the design and then taking into the uh, implementation and, uh, um, and then looking after, actually, uh, once it's done. And I believe one of those gaps, actually, which we have been seeing through this, uh, this work is also that it's very sporadic. So there is nothing, actually, that, that can say that, you know, pick this up. And one of the reasons for that is that it has to be more bespoke. So um, thank you very much. I think this is very um, uh, uh, useful insight. Um, I'm going to move on to my second question, uh, and that is the, uh, how do we achieve more and more green and blue spaces our, in our towns and cities? Steve? It's, it's almost a repetition of the themes that we were just talking about in some respects because the same constraints mm -hmm. repeat themselves. But yeah, fundamentally to achieve more, I think we need to be creative within our professional spheres and reach out to other professionals that aren't necessarily expecting us to talk to them mm. and be creative with our funding um, regimes, whether it's through central government or in the case of Newport, Welsh government, <laughs> um, devolved governments different to English government, I've discovered. So the landscape can vary uh, appreciably. But um, yeah, 
um, enthusiasm and funding go a long, long way. And you need to find, find the people that are enthusiastic within the community and professional groups. And you've got a good foundation on which to start. Um, if you can't find people that are enthusiastic or they're stuck in their silos, you find yourself hitting your head against a wall. I think that's a very good point. And to being enthusiastic and funding. I think we should note that. <laughs> um, maybe we can go to Joanna then. Yeah, very similar. Um, the biggest thing I've found in the last four years since we've been de delivering blue and green infrastructure in South End is changing mindsets. And it's not really, I'm not talking about all the stakeholders, I'm talking about colleagues and fellow practitioners. There's a lot of perceived issues around blue and green, like there was with suds, you know, when the suds first came out. Oh, they're too expensive, they're too difficult, they take up too, too much space, they look scruffy. We're taking space away from tourism. So I think if you can actually dispel some of those myths and be enthusiastic, as you were saying, get people on board. And whenever we do approach a scheme in South End, we go for the whole, the whole street approach. So Where's the climate team? Let's have a chat to Parks. What's, what's Highways team doing? Let's have a chat. You know, we talk to everybody within the council. And that way, um, and m quite recently, actually, external organisations like the Water Company, and when you put that pot of money together and you're all trying to achieve the same thing, you can get so much more done. Yeah. And you have this constant exchange of skills and ideas. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really good way to go. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Colin, what do you think? I think there's a couple of things, really. I'll just have a quick poll. Can you put your hand up if you think that parks and open spaces are a statutory service for local government? So, yeah. There's a few hands up. So, hands up if you think that they aren't a statutory service. So, yeah, second is the correct answer, <laughs> that parks and open spaces are not a statutory obligation for local government. There are loads of statutory obligations on local government that you can't provide without parks and open spaces, mm. but they aren't specifically. It was a recommendation of a government um, body a number of years ago, decades. There was a recent parks action group that looked into it and then didn't go ahead. And I know libraries are a statutory service, and we've all seen what's happened to libraries over the years, but it is something that does need to be into government policy that they are uh, to mm -hmm. give people access within 10-15 mm -hmm. minutes to a good quality open space ideally that meets green flag standards uh, that are out there <laughs> and the funding to deliver that because uh, they can hang any number of hats on names of levelling up and all these sorts of different things they're not going to get achieved without public open spaces being funded properly to deliver air quality, leisure well-being, inclusivity um, all of the wonderful things that have been talked about today um, and I think the other opportunities that we have are in terms of development and regeneration. Um, if you go back to the pre-pandemic days and talked about town centre regeneration and turning over commercial space to public open spaces, no one would, you know, you'd get laughed out of the room, basically. But mm -hmm. I think now with the decline of the high street and shifting uh, things, then putting public open spaces which are suitable for events and socialising within the town centre will actually draw people in more rather than a chain, uh, high street store. So there's opportunities there, I think. But uh, the caveat I would place upon that is within new developments, developers are quite often mainly interested in the bottom line. And in terms of the quality of the open spaces, not being what should have been built as part of the planning conditions and the quality of the build are, are quite severe issues. But there are opportunities there if they can get everything together and working well. Yeah, so that's a very, um, you made a very important point, and knowing that that's not a statutory service, I think that makes quite a lot of sense in terms of what is needed actually to make the, the bigger changes in the system. So I'm sorry, Deborah, you are again the last, actually. No, this is, uh, this is fantastic for me. And I, I want to pick up on uh, something Colin said about the Green Flag Award standard. It's the national standard for parks and open spaces, not only in the UK now, but nation internationally. And um, uh, having been a Green Flag Award judge for over 20 years, you know, if there's one thing you might do as a result of this conference, go out and volunteer to be one and you know, see all the excellence out there. Uh, but that is more of a kind of, I think it's a 12-point system, isn't it, for, um, uh, and a national standard, not a badge of excellence as such. 
Um, but I think uh, that's, that's the, the route I'm going down in, in terms of answering this question um, about, you know, find your uh, system, your checklist or your design code. So in Surrey, we've recently completed something called Healthy Streets for Surrey, which is our design code for movement and public realm. Um, it's very much the latest thing, mm -hmm. the Department of Leveling Up and Housing and Communities wanting all local authorities to have one. Um, and that is where we now have not only a, a design uh, requirements for new housing development, so you must do this or should or could, so you know, prescribing sustainable drainage, uh, planting, tree planting and so on, um, but we also have it in retrofit situations. So where we are as the highways authority in Surrey uh, or uh, in other urban settings are digging up the road to do something differently, we're now required to follow it as well. Um, I'm not saying uh, it's going to be as easy as pie because you have to, even your own engineers will try to, you know, um, mm -hmm. Uh, find ways around some of the, the requirements. And in, in an existing road space, you do have uh, a very limited space to do all the things you want to do. But I think it was Joanne who mentioned that kind of multifunctionality um, uh, of, uh, you know, it's not just the opportunity to deliver green or blue spaces. They're green spaces with blue elements like sustainable drainage or a, a small canal or a, 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 a rill going through a development. Uh, these are places to take uh, grey water as well as uh, provide sustainable drainage. Uh, these are places that will support biodiversity. So, you know, you've got that multifunctionality now. And I, and I think there is a broader understanding within mm -hmm. local government. But I, I go back to that um, point that Steve made about, you know, uh, internal teams. If they're not lining up, um, then you've kind of lost half the fight. But if you can create that momentum between teams where they're, they're realising their objectives with you all at the same time, everyone's happy, you know, and residents are happy. Yeah. Very good point. <coughs> so I'm going to move on to my last question. And uh, if you want, Deborah, we can change the order this time. <laughs> <laughs> And that is, can you give any good examples of successful green and blue infrastructure in your town or city? Yeah. Maybe we can start with you, Deborah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be a ruthless promotion now for the Surrey Green and Blue Infrastructure uh, Design Guide and Case Studies. And one I'd pick out from that is the watercolour development in Merstham, near Red Hill in Surrey, uh, very close by to where I live, so I can attest to it being a very nice open space. Um, it, it took that kind of infrastructure first principle, so uh, built on uh, a 27 hectare former sand quarry, it involved uh, uh, an enhancement strategy leading into a master plan before the delivery of the various mm. open spaces. So the sort of things we have there are lagoons, uh, an open brook, uh, there's a small canal that re redirects drainage water and it, it links into the wider Nutfield marshes. Uh, and you can walk or cycle into the town nearby. Um, and I know from my house I can walk up there in a morning and get a, a beautiful view of the lake. Um, so people will go there to, to walk and, and get a wonderful bit of recreation as well as use it on their doorstep. So that, that's, a, that's one that we've got written down. And then I've got a couple of others that I personally like. Mm -hmm. um, I love the Habitat project that was delivered on the campus here. Um, I think it shows how arts mm -hmm. and meadow planting and that kind of facilities management can really go hand in hand. Um, and I'd, lo I'd love to see it before I leave the campus because I think I saw it this time last year, and just to see if it's still looking mm -hmm. as good as it was. Um, another one that I love is the Sheffield Greater Green. Um, uh, which is uh, essentially a regeneration area of Sheffield that could quite easily have become a very grey and relentless uh, piece of regeneration in an economic development area. Um, but it has uh, realised some fantastic ab ambitions for sustainable drainage, a real exemplar for seeing beautiful planting uh, where, where rainwater is collected and diverted off the highway, um, a phenomenal uptick of uh, cycling walking. And so if, if anyone wants, you know, just wants to 
get, a, get on a train to Sheffield and use your uh, you know, Google Maps to get you there. Go for the day and walk around, uh, see the beautiful planting and, uh, and beautifully maintained as well uh, by a, a land management company. So, um, so yeah, just a few examples there. Yeah, fantastic. They all look very good. Okay, um, we're going to go to uh, Colin. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the examples I'd like to talk about in rugby uh, is we have a area now which is now known as Centenary Park. Um, it was an area which was an allotment site for many years in one of our socially deprived areas of rugby. Um, that was compulsory purchased by the County Council for building a relief road through rugby, uh, we're two tier. Um, and they altered the routes for various reasons, which meant that we got some of the allotment land back, but it had been left overgrown for about 15 years, contaminated with fly tipping and uh, road construction issues and all sorts of things, and uh, it was very overgrown. You couldn't walk from one side of the site to the other because of bind weed and bramble that were above your head. Um, the local residents were obviously not very happy about that, that they felt they had their allotments taken off them and then a busy road um, put through their, their estate in return. So, um, and they were also very wary that it was suddenly going to be developed and built on as well. Uh, it's adjacent to the River Avon in uh, Rugby, um, so a lot could have been done with it to improve it. Uh, so we worked with the local community group. Um, we drew up a master plan for the site. Um, they wanted some allotments back, but they did want to park an open space. And they also didn't want to lose the wildlife uh, aspect, which had obviously um, been factored in there as well. Mm. Uh, so we managed to get um, three different lots of landfill community funding from uh, what are now Veolia, um, CETA, and FCC. Uh, and we also got uh, grants from Woodland Trust as well. So uh, we created a park and what will be allotments as well. Um, kilometres of new hedgerow, uh, loads of feature trees on there, new pathways. Uh, we made sure we retained some areas of bramble for things like nesting sparrows, which you can see fluttering in and out all the time as well, so we didn't lose that. Uh, above and below ground, hibernacula, which we lose some of the waste that we found on site when we were clearing. I think it was about... There was a good few hundred tons of um, fly tip tyres and all sorts of things like that that we took off the site as well. Uh, we put a play area in, a multi-use games area, a sensory garden, um, which we also, working with the local school, we gave a name, uh, protected the site with Fields in Trust as well. Um, so it's protected as a public open space in perpetuity now. Uh, we also put, uh, they chose the name as Centenary Park uh, because it was coming off the centenary commemorations of the Great War at the time. So we also have a granite um, pillar cut off an angle. Uh, those who may know Victorian cemeteries, um, sort of you see a pillar there cut off, that's a, a symbol of a life cut short, so it was obviously quite fitting uh, for informal things within the centenary park. And we also created a, the first butterfly bank in rugby as well, uh, sort of inverted uh, subsoil on there with, with a mound uh, so it catches the sunlight through the day. Um, and it's got calcareous stones on and planting on there for capturing uh, quite a wide variety of micro niches and habitats for, for butterflies as well. Uh, it won the Fields and Trust Award for most improved site uh, in the country in 2015. Um, so yeah, it's now a Green Flag Award winning park as well. So, um, and just to come back to the Green Flag, if you are connected with a university, <laughs> universities are eligible, make sure you put them in. It was great to see the Green Flag flying here. Um, and the other project I'd like to talk about is just what we call our Park Connector Networks in rugby, which in essence is improving our desire lines and pathways through our parks and open spaces where they connect to each other, um, raising them up on the ground levels, widening them out to three metres for the shared use. Uh, we've also put in solar powered way marking lights, uh, which have got what they call bat hats on the top, which reduce light pollution by 97%. Um, so it encourages usage all year round, uh, more resilient for the changing climate as well, encouraging active travel, um, making mm -hmm. sites more safer for women and girls and other at risk groups as well. So. Fantastic, yeah, thank you. Did you know? <laughs> uh, okay, so South End. So I've got two hats at South End. I've got my LLFA hat, so I'm looking at surface water flood risk, and I've also got my CPA hat, so I'm the Coastal Protection Manager as well. So a couple of schemes I'm just going to talk about. Um, SARC, if anyone's aware of SARC, Sustainable Resilient Coastal Cities. It's the EU project, just finished. Uh, we've been partners in that for a number of years. So we were basically looking at how we can improve our coastal defences um, in, in basically incorporate more green into them. Um, so we've got things like green gabion basket walls now. We have got, uh, what we've got 
called vertipoles are in our port and harbour area. They're really good at dissipating the energy coming off the waves. Again, that then takes some of the energy off of our coastal defences. Um, we have some areas where we have very specialised habitat on, shingle be on our shingle beaches. So rather than going out, raking it like we did in the old days, we're actually protecting that and enhancing it. We're collecting seeds in the autumn, propagating those in our own nursery, and then we're planting those plants out in the spring. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. The roots bind into the shingle, which basically creates a, a defence in front of the defence. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the same up in our sand dunes as well. We're collecting seeds, native plants, growing them on and planting them in. So that's one of the one of the things we've been doing over the last few years. Um, FCRIP, or Flood and Coastal Resilience Innovation Programme, South End is one of the 25 national projects. Um, I'm the project lead for Catchment to Coast, and it's exactly what it says on the tin. So we are taking a catchment approach to flood and coastal erosion. We're basically, our project works in the upper, middle, and lower catchment. So top, middle, and bottom, anyone in the room old enough to remember that catchphrase? So we're basically looking at measures in those three areas, but we're also looking at measures in combination. So at the end of the project, we want to see how blue-green na um, nature-based solutions work <coughs> in situ, but also how they work over the entire catchment. So there's a whole lot of things going on in that, from regenerative, regenerative agriculture to leaky dams with mycelium, because we're looking at secondary benefits, so water quality, biodiversity, air quality, all of that as well. We're doing lots of retrofit in the middle catchment and we're also working with developers. So we've got a retrofit demonstration house that's going to be going live in November. So there'll be lots of information about that on the website. And my, my team and the energy team have basically sustainabilised the house. Anything that can have a sustainable element to it is in this house as a demonstration project. And we're also building some new houses ourselves, social housing, so we're taking that technology and those approaches into that. Um, and then we're looking at the coast as well. So we have um, coastal landfill sites in South End that we can't realign, we can't move, we can't do anything with them. We can't patch and repair. We don't get any funding from the EA for them because nobody lives there. And if you don't live there, you don't get any points, you don't get any prizes from flood defence grants and aid. So we have to fund that ourselves. So we're looking at things like biotiles. We're looking at um, creating um, more salt marsh, looking at in new, new ways using koi matting and things like that. And we're also looking at offshore barriers so we can actually take some of that energy out of the fetch, which is what's coming in and really damaging our defences. So there's lots and lots of bits to that. So if you want to know more about it, please do come and speak to me. Um, and then our new flagship project is uh, Marine Parade, which is a sustainable approach to water management. And again, it's going back to that whole street approach, looking at water. Um, our catchphrase is managing the flow high or low. So what we're doing, we get a lot of issues with drought in South End in the summer. So we're looking at innovative ways that we can capture rainwater, but also the two difficult pile as well. We're looking at highways runoff. We're treating the highway runoff with bi bi biological filters, mycelium. We're finding safe ways to store that. And we're allowing the community to reuse that, whether that's in allotments or for our parks team, so they don't have to take water off the tap. They can go... They can go fill up their bowsers from these, from these tanks. And also, we're looking at biodiversity, heat, stress, social value, all of that as well. So there's a couple of very big projects going on in the South End. So if you want to come and find out about them, then please come and speak to me. <laughs> yes, it for sure looks like there's a lot going on. There's a lot going um, on in the South End, yeah. Yeah, um, so I think we're going to go back to Steve, and then I guess we also wanted to open this discussion. So let's, uh, Steve... If you can briefly describe. Yeah. I was, was going to say, you three have tired me out. Just, 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 just listening. I'm, I'm, I'm in, in the fairly early stages of my green and blue infrastructure journey. And uh, it would be fair to say that my sort of um, embedding of it is fairly modest at the present moment in time. But the, uh, on a um, reactive basis, one mm -hmm. of the things I'm most pleased with in the past sort of 18 months is that uh, I've embedded into my planning consultation role a standing um, requirement for air quality beneficial plantings on any new development where the opportunity exists. Mm. I try and get it as a condition, but I always make sure it's there as an informative at the very least. So I'm pushing that envelope 
um, with your publication in the background to assist people that don't know where they should be looking, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So that's the, react, the reactive piece that I'm involved with. But proactively, through my air quality action planning, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a planning consultee for air quality as well. Um, I've taken a few opportunities to explore community-based uh, air quality interventions um, in tandem with our air quality action planning that we have to do as a statutory uh, uh, document. And um, some recent dispersion modeling has supported the uh, need for a green barrier where currently we've just got a protective road, a uh, bit of ro steel road barrier, which will uh, allow the uh, incident traffic pollution to be reduced through the uh, incorporation of a green barrier. And um, I'm hoping to uh, get that past the uh, member of the Senate who will be at our air quality group meeting tomorrow evening with the local community. So, uh, yeah, it's an exciting time proactively, but it's arguably the icing on the cake, which is not my core offer as a job. My day job is just monitoring air quality and reporting on it annually. So I'm pushing myself outside of my comfort zone, and I think that's what a lot of these opportunities require us to do within all our settings, is to go that extra mile. Otherwise, a lot of people will just say, meh, I'm doing, I'm doing all I need to do for my job. But, Thank you, Steve. I think you gave another keyword of extra mile and good luck <laughs> Thank tomorrow. You. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to open this conversation for our audience. Uh, we've got uh, two of our colleagues, actually. So if you can raise your hand if you have any question. Tom. Hi, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I just had a question about um, sort of the decisions and the challenges that local authorities often have to deal with, where, where something is environmentally beneficial but publicly, politically not very popular. And I'm thinking things like on the coast, things like managed realignment. I'm thinking about where you have to remove established non-native trees to replace with um, kind of um, sort of indigenous, more biodiversity beneficial um, species. And sort of those other decisions which can be quite unpopular but environmentally very necessary. Um, how, how do you guys kind of deal with that? <coughs> I've got a good example. Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> it, it, it can be very difficult. Um, we, we had a local uh, minister who wanted to install a heat pump system in her church as part of a refurb opportunity, and where they wanted to site a particular piece of plant within a very tasteful and sympathetic housing that wouldn't have made things look particularly bad, they came up across all sorts of problems with a tree officer because of a, a root system for a tree. So you could sometimes get this dichotomy between sort of getting the environmental considerations sort of straight, yet there's a, there's a climate change uh, impacting opportunity here, potentially, once they've got their source heat pumps sorted, um, to, to improve things. And it, it, it's not easy, is it? No. No. Yep. Okay, you want to add Sorry. something? That was yeah. all right. I was going to say, um, technology is great. So, um, for example, we're using a lot of um, hydro rock products at the moment in terms of um, flood resilience because they're 100% sustainable. They're great. can be taken out the ground, recycled and made into more hydro rocks and put back in. They're brilliant at um, actually storing water and letting that water naturally go back into the ground. But for trees particularly, because you can cut them to at the size you want and they don't impact root systems. So the evidence is there that you can go to your tree officer, explain about the technology. <clears throat> when we first showed it to them, they were a little bit sceptical. But now, you know, we've used them in anger. Their trees are fine. The flooding has been resolved. So technology is great. There's lots of new things out there that you can, you can do. Thank you. Controversy we've had has been around, um, we've been doing what we've done rugby or no mow areas or urban meadows where we've been leaving lots of areas uh, of longer grass. 
that came on the back of some, using some pictorial meadow mixes, which were colourful on road verges, and they proved very popular, which then allowed us to roll that out a bit more. But um, it's become a bit of a culture war nationally around some of these. Mm. We adopted a mosaic approach on our larger parts and open spaces. We will have areas which are left over um, for sort of meadow management, basically, for part of the year. And then we will still leave areas of short grass for kicking a ball around, throwing a ball for the dog, etc. Um, but, yeah, we have found that some people... Most people are in favour and stay silent, um, but you will get a very cool uh, minority on both sides for and against um, people that want us to not cut our sports pitches as well, or people that uh, sort of, yeah, want us to cut everything all year round pretty much. Um, so, yeah, that's been one of those things, and you will get politicians that will flip flop a bit that will vote in favour of our pollinator strategy and then turn around. This resident says that looks untidy, can you go and cut it, please? And it is that balance. Uh, and a bit similar, we had a tree policy which was passed at the same time. We've now got a few councillors who are starting because the general election's coming and also um, when the local elections come up, they will come around and they'll ask us to remove healthy trees because the residents don't like it because it's shading their garden or they claim it's affecting their satellite TV signal. And it's those types of things where you, you do need the officers to be reversed and then be backed by senior management and, and uh, councillors. Okay, I think we got a question from this side. Um, I'm, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm aware that I've had some air time, so if there's anyone else who's got a question. Okay. Um, this one's about funding, actually, and um, thinking about if it's inevitable. Um, I read something recently about private companies doing multi-year deals with councils in London, for example, uh, for big events, like big music events. As a, probably as a way of drawing in funding, but inadvertently that's caused a lot of damage. For example, a tough mudder um, route that went right through a community orchard. Um, and I'm wondering if that's happened in your areas, if you've had like deals with events companies in the same way, and to what extent it might be possible to leverage those deals to include biodiversity as part of that. I mean, I, I feel I ought to say something because I didn't, didn't in the last one. I mean, I, I'm not um, directly involved in um, the management of parks and open spaces, but I, I have a lot of experience through the Green Flag Network. And um, you do see that. I think there's a big tension between um, councils needing to attract income and sustain their staffing. And then um, there, there's always been a big healthy debate in this country about should you charge for parks and th that sense that this should be a democratic environment that everyone has access to. Personally, I'm, I'm in favour of a, a blended approach, so you do charge for some things. Um, and certainly you would, you know, look to leverage income or, or at least, you know, cover your costs with, with those events companies and perhaps have a cordoned off area where something was happening. But um, it's probably only experience that tells you, uh, you know, what sort of uh, what's, what sort of fee you need to ask for. And I would say reach out to others in 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 that local authority network. Mm. So there's always somebody who's done it already. Um, so not just to assume that you you've got to find all the answers yourself. Um, but yeah, reach out and find somebody who's done it before and and actually get a sense of. Um, uh, you know how much you need to charge, but then arguably no amount of money is going to restore a habitat that's been spoiled by uh, an, a, a badly thought out event. So know why you're holding that event and what what the you know what what the balance of risk is on on that piece of land. And uh, uh, the best I've seen is where um, perhaps more uh, standard land, you know, grassed areas are used for public events. So, yeah, I would say, you know, think very carefully about the, what land you're using, what for, what you need to uh, get, uh, get sort of recharged for and so on. I think it's one of these things that has to be around a population mm -hmm. size, which is suitably big enough, and then the infrastructure, so Hyde Park, Eaton Park, etc., um, particularly in the London parks. I know it is a, a point of major controversy. Um, I have to say, as both a parky and a music fan, I've been to the festivals in Hyde Park, and they are, they are brilliant, but obviously it is a, a case of losing public open space for a section of time. But it does obviously provide the income then for providing the facility for the rest of the year. So I think it's a bit of a balance. And I guess you guys as well, you'll have community events within our parks and they can do damage. Quite often it'll be the local Rotary Club or whoever. And you can end up with pressure then of, oh, they need to do that to raise a few thousand for local charities. And it's like, well, actually, they've done £10,000 worth of damage to our park. 
uh, so it does affect us at that level, but it's not to the same degree as Hyde Park, Eaton Park, etc. So. so we need to build in a bit of ecological resilience into yeah. our events planning, because um, yep. we, Trade- we have Tradiga Park in Newport, and no, I didn't get to see Feeder, I missed out on that, but hey, you can't do everything. But look, um, why can't we have a bit more of a consideration of the ecological aspects of of an event and if necessary protect certain parts of the field so the recovery process is 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 easier to sort of literally cross fertilize across the uh, impacted area perhaps um, and I'm not even a parkie so uh, you know I know I, I, I get the principle of it definitely uh, I think it's a really good point of uh, considering the ecological impact in the planning yeah. of these events uh, in the interest of time I think this is a very interesting discussion but maybe we just take one last question before we close. Okay, so we can see two maybe. So one from here, one from there. Maybe we can let one of the people to respond, or maybe two of them. Um, you want to go first? Yeah, go first. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, maybe I can uh, lead off some, uh, the other question. Uh, I was, uh, sort of, uh, I can merge it into my question. So in terms of events, uh, when you put it on an event, is there any criteria that you choose to put it on um, because the, the thing I've looked at in the past is when you put, put an event on then obviously the air quality goes up the, the air quality goes up a lot uh, and the, so is there any like criteria that you have for and is there possible a national one for that and my the question I want to ask is uh, what um, sort of departments are the most important to work with so you yeah. talked about working with other departments so what are the other departments to work with. Okay. Steve is going to take on this one. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be the health and safety team of the council and the licensing team who would have an um, environmental uh, safety advisory group known as an ESAG, and essentially that would comprise the local authority, the police, uh, the ambulance service, the organisers of the event and their security. And of course, an ecologist doesn't really get a look in. An acoustician like myself might get a look in from the... Uh, uh, sort of community noise aspect. Um, the air quality aspect, it, it's a temporal air quality um, event, if you like, happening. If it was going on every week at a significant um, intensity, then I think the consideration of the air quality aspects and making them do things like you must run on electric, um, having hub and cluster deliveries to the site with plant and um, uh, buildings using electric, you know, whatever can be done to minimise the, uh, the footprint of the event. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's fairly nailed down with a, 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 an event licence, um, especially things like Glastonbury Festival that I've worked on for the acoustic side of things historically, and WOMAD when I was with Wiltshire, and uh, yeah, it's it's they're, they're interesting, but. Some of the more important things tend to be things like the safety of the drinking water on site, and what do we do if there's a terror incident? You know, that's some. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to say on a slightly different note, if we're doing a big scheme, we will have that. We will speak to the contractor and make sure they operate their works as sustainably as they can. So whether that's equipment, traffic movements their welfare facilities, all of those kind of things, those are built into, into the job. Okay, great, fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll take the last question. Uh, thank you. The flood risk manager in Cardiff Council. I know you're paying being the coastal manager as well. Um, my question, uh, I was going to say, obviously Schedule 3, the Flood and Water <coughs> Management Act, came in in Wales, so naturally yes. it's green infrastructure going across the cities, and I think it will come in in England, so... It's going to be an interesting time for you. But the biggest issue we had was where legislation clashed. And we have it a lot with the Town and Country Planning Act and the Flood and Water Management Act, or building regs, and what, or Land Drainage Act. They all clash with each other. So I was just wondering what your opinions were with green infrastructure, green blue infrastructure, where you want to install it, but there's a bit of legislation, or, such as, or policy, such as building regs, that you've got to work out or what's going to stop you doing it. How we counteract that and how we overcome that issue because I think that is the biggest issue we've experienced where great we come up with a brilliant design and then the last moment someone says you can't do that because of that tree or you can't do that because of that water course etc so 
just how you feel about legislation clashing against each other, that's going to stop green infrastructure being built and how we overcome that. Sorry. <laughs> I was, was going to say something on that. So, yeah. um, I mentioned design coding earlier on, and I think if you do have an adopted design code, either at a borough level or a county council level, then at least you've had that period of time to consider all the legislation and the, the policy imperatives, and you've got something that reflects all of it. So you, you kind of have perhaps have more confidence and certainty that you can deliver something or you can advocate that to, to developers to deliver. Um, I'm not saying it would uh, o overcome every circumstance one, once you're at that stage. And sometimes... Um, you know, perhaps, perhaps sometimes when there is a clash, it's, it, it's sort of good to have that debate about what then what holds sway. Because I, I mentioned earlier that, that point about re retrofitting in our streets. You're not always going to be able to uphold everything because there's only mm. limited road space. So there's always going to be some uh, negotiation, some, some, you know... Um, uh, but I don't think you can ever have stasis. So you can't... You, you can't um, yeah, just just be so caught up in legislation that you you stop doing anything, but just know why you've made that decision, uh, and and ideally have your own design code so you can proceed with confidence that that's what your council does, that that's what will get you results. I think a lot of things as well within open spaces would be classed as permitted development anyway, so you wouldn't have to go through planning uh, formal planning approval for permission. Mm -hmm. Um, and then even if you do, then quite often they'll weigh up things of a balance of, you know, for and against. And if, uh, you know, if they've made a difficulty with legislation clashing with each other, eventually it will go up to an appeal to the minister to make a decision anyway, or the planning inspector uh, um, on that side of things. But, yeah, it is an interesting one on some of the guidance. So if you had a, a TPO, for example, on something, it was a minor works or something. Yeah. Do, do you have a supplementary planning guide on green and blue infrastructure that you can kind of use as, as an interpretive um, We don't. Area. I, I'm very lucky. I'm one of the few authorities, LLFAs in Wales, where we get on with our planning <laughs> department. Right. And to be honest, they, they're the first right. line of defence with SAB and SUDS because they often yeah. will screen it for us before it even gets to us. Right. The, the, the big one we have is building regs. It's a big issue because of Sokoways right. being within five metres of buildings and all of this. And it, it's difficult because with the new legislation with SAB, there isn't any case law or anything yet. So it's just difficult. And we say, well, you, you've got to do that. And they say, OK, well, your 278 officer told me I need to do this. And it's like, well, sorry. It, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. At the moment, we don't. We are working on it. But, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's, it, it also depends. I mean, I work in a unitary authority, so my planning team are like two desks away and I can throw something at them to get their attention. So we get on really well. So we're developing the new local plan. We're developing our new SUDS design policy. We're developing our blue-green infrastructure, supplementary guidance together, and with highways and with parks so, and building control as well. So that's the good start. Um, yeah, Schedule 3 is going to be very interesting. We're starting to gear up for that at the moment. Um, and again, it goes back to the advances in technology. So we've had this soak away issue as well. But again, with applying things like hydro rocks, you can actually do something different and find a way around that. And the big part of Catchment to Coast is it's a evidence gathering six year project. So we've had kit in the ground for nearly 18 months getting all our baseline data. So at the end of six years, we can give this information back to DEFRA and say, look, we found this nature-based solutions work. This does work. Here's the evidence, and we're going to lobby you to change policy. That's what the whole point of FCRIP is. Coastal Protection Act. So old, useless. We need to change it. But you need the evidence mm. to go up to, up to Whitehall, up to Westminster, and say, this is why this needs to change. And that is the biggest thing about FCRIP that people don't realise. It's a data-led project, and we're constantly getting information so we can influence future policy and future funding. Okay, thank you. Um, the discussions were so interesting that uh, this is possibly the first session which has gone past the time <laughs> <laughs> we had. But uh, 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 thank you very much for all your valuable insight and uh, very interesting and important discussions. 
Um, can we give a big round of applause to our <laughs> panelists? Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Um, I think we have reached to now to our last session. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to, it's perfectly fine. Um, so, so this is basically the time to say bye, but uh, not to say goodbye completely. Um, it's been a fantastic day, but before um, I, we kind of you know close this um, you know this workshop today. I would like to invite all my co-investigators to the front. Uh, they have also been the chair of uh, the various sessions. Uh, just to say the, the few concluding words, but no more than, let's say, a minute, or maybe 30 seconds, if they can do something. But I think it might be an opportunity to also uh, you know, um, to re reflect on the day and the sessions actually they, uh, you know, they took forward. Can I please ask to come on front? Thomas, Neria, Lawrence, Sila. Please take a seat. Uh, if you can have the mic, actually. So basically, I'm dividing my work workload equally uh, to conclude this session. So this is possibly one of my strategy. How to how to get you in? So um, yeah, I, mean, I think it would be fantastic to hear from you. Uh, you know your reflection on the day, especially on the sessions you carried, and if there are any any words you wanted to you know put forward to the uh, the audience today. Should I start? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah, that's on. <laughs> um, personally, I found that last session um, with our representatives from just four towns and cities, I found that incredibly interesting and useful. Hearing about your challenges day to day on the ground, but also sort of echoing some of the work that's been presented and discussed today from you know, from the funded projects and the reviews. And I think there's there's huge scope for, and that's the, po the point of the network really, is for people to keep talking to each other. So, you know, you can use the website to get in contact with other people with similar interests. 
and it's just an opportunity for, you know, there was lots of sort of synergy, lots of people talking to their local communities about, you know, what matters to them, the sort of examples from RIL where very, very small minority of people but speak very loudly, suggesting that there's a very strong sort of anti-tree or anti-wildflower sentiment. But actually the vast majority are strong, silent supporters, but maybe they don't make their presence known. And that sort of thing is really encouraging, I think, when you're probably kind of getting it in the neck because someone's complaining about they want a tree cut down next to them kind of thing. So, so I think that just sort of illustrates some of the opportunities of uh, kind of building on what Neria said really, it's sort of interdisciplinarity and sort of scientists with a huge range of different backgrounds working with city officials and working with the public to find out what people want and how we can get the kind of information to support sensible and future-proof decision making. Thank you, Lawrence. I, th I think I'm in that situation where I've come last again and everyone's said a lot of things. One of the things is, you know, I'm, I, I actually work in the School of Ocean Sciences in Bangor University. Um, so we do a lot of things right the way out to the, to the, to the, into the shelf seas and out into the sea. But we also do a lot on coasts and that works back into the, into the urban environment. And I think one of the things that's demonstrated to me is it's all interconnected. And we do have to use nature-based solutions going forward. And I think also this network is part of that collaboration, is getting people talking to each other to understand what different needs are and moving that forward. And I'd hope that this was just the beginning of something and definitely not the finish or the ending of, a, of a, you know, at the end of a conference. Um, so I would hope that actually, and I think that's one of the messages I would take away, is that we do start working together more. We start looking at what the potential opportunities are and how we can make the most of those for, for, for society going forward. And I don't think I want to say much more than that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, please, yeah. No problem, yeah. So thank you very much. And can we give a big round of applause to the people behind the network? So I'll just take two more minutes, I promise, maybe three or four. Um, so as, as you rightly heard, actually, so uh, this is not the closing event for the network. So like typically you see there is a closing kind of event. Um, this is, we are nearly middle of the the kind of period of the network, and we got a year extension. And this is a fantastic opportunity to talk with each other and also carry forward the ideas and the discussion you had during the day. Now, there are two things I would like to emphasize here. Uh, on the website of the Reclaim Network, we spend quite a lot of time, and we have developed a, a page called Resources. So if you haven't got an opportunity, please visit that page. You can find the resources related to the green walls, green roofs, you know, the, uh, the all sort of nature-based solutions. And these are the open access things which is invited by the community so they can put their own reports and, uh, uh, you know, the papers or the videos or any related information. So I think this resource is basically created so that, you know, we all can benefit from each other's work. So I would strongly suggest to you to, to visit that page. Uh, the, another uh, important thing is the, uh, the members uh, area of the network. Uh, where we got around uh, 520 plus members at the movement, uh, representing over 45 countries. The whole idea of this, uh, um, this members area was that you can find the people you might feel actually be useful while you're designing your actions about the implementation of nature-based solutions. So I would, I would again request to you to either sign in by yourself or uh, share among your colleagues uh, to uh, make use of that opportunity and that resource we have created here. 
Um, one of the very important things which we had in mind uh, you know, in the network was how we can bring the diversity, can encourage the young researchers, uh, bring the more like a, you know, the equality, diversity, and inclusion uh, you know, in the process. So you might have seen today, we got loads of uh, young researchers. A lot of them, they are st still doing PhDs. Some have just started, uh, you know, their postdoctoral research or their academic careers. So we were, you know, very kind of conscious of the fact that we wanted to give opportunity to everyone uh, in the best possible manner, and uh, and that has been in ethos of uh, the network. Uh, apart from also thinking very closely that how we can bring the level up agenda. So you might see quite a lot of projects actually that come from the areas where you might not have seen a lot of research coming through. So it's basically triggering those actions and research that could possibly help the community going forward. Um, as I said, this is um, the, one of the, the most important thing for us is that how do we continue? So looking forward, the, one of the, the very important things for us is uh, um, to continue the momentum of the network. So we have got the webinars, uh, monthly webinars going on. Uh, and I would again uh, request you to see if there are opportunities for you to promote them and also put yourself forward uh, to become one of the speakers. So we had a um, fantastic presentation from Angus. So Angus is here and we got a Scottscape actually. They have put their, you know, the, the pillar and possibly uh, we got a very positive feedback from a lot of people who really enjoyed the presentation because that was something which they wanted to see happening in the real world. So the people like yourself who have been working in this area, you got a wealth of knowledge and experience and the case studies you might have created and we can provide that opportunity through the network to disseminate and share with the wider community and the others could benefit from that, uh, you know, from that experience. Now, what we want is, um, through the, uh, the reviews, we are hoping to highlight a number of, uh, you know, the gaps of the research areas and that we will be feeding to the uh, UKRI because they are very keen to know that what are the gaps so that they can bring in future calls in that area. So it means that there might be opportunity for funding in future. Uh, the, the projects which had been running, so the whole idea of these projects were to make sure that they hit the multi-benefits of the, um, you know, the, the green, blue infrastructure, and they create the case studies so that they could be rolled out in uh, different places. So we got around 60 plus applications across the UK, and nine of these projects were funded on a very competitive basis, make, uh, the, all of them like meeting those criteria there. So we're looking forward actually to delivering the impact through these projects, uh, which will be uh, you know, something to, to watch for uh, in coming future. Now, we as a team, uh, you know, working together with, the, with colleagues, trying basically to see if we can bring in the future grants in that area. So we are keeping uh, you know, a close eye and uh, um, we'll be very you know, proactively looking for further opportunities of funding. And in this kind of domain, the one of the successes we have so far is uh, having a center for doctoral training in nature-based solutions. So this was a call from the NERC and uh, there were around 160 odd uh, expressions submitted and we have been one of those who have been selected to go to the second round. So we have been working on the application at the moment and many of you sitting here might receive an email for some sort of support uh, you know, from you for that application. And that would be a fantastic opportunity if we win that funding to have around 30 to 40 PhDs working across this topic and you can think actually what will be the level of impact that these PhD projects will make uh, you know, to uh, uh, push forward this agenda and uh, this particular area. So I will stop here, otherwise I will keep talking, as usually academics do. But before I do, I need to um, uh, acknowledge the, the support and the people actually who have been behind uh, this event, and that was not possible without uh, you know, their efforts. Uh, the Mark Siemens, so he's here, he's our network manager. So we wanted to give him a big round of applause. We got Charlotte, I'm not sure where is she. Ah, she's sitting here. Uh, we got our network fellow, uh, Sise. And most importantly, we should not forget that all this logistics and all have been done by Anna's team. We would not be able to do that without her support. So can we please? Thank you. 
So last but not the least, I would like you to thank. I know that uh, it's, uh, you know, everyone is so busy. And I saw that you have been here since the morning, very engaged, talking outside with the people and developing that network. So thank you for coming and being part of this uh, exciting network and the journey we have taken towards implementing these nature-based solutions in sustainable environment. I'm not missing anything else, right? If not, then with that, I would like you to uh, thank again and uh, have a safe journey back. I think we, some of us are meeting uh, towards the, um, uh, you know, um, in, in a while. So yeah, we look forward to see you in the webinars or in workshops and uh, you know, developing the joint initiatives in future. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>